This video is made possible by Practical Defense Systems, the best online security training at the lowest prices. You can start your security career today online at pdsclasses.com. Check them out. Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. It's time for the Gun Guy TV podcast. Hi, this is Joel Persinger. I'm the Gun Guy. Thank you very much for all of your support on Gun Guy TV. I'm very, very grateful for everything you do. Now, there are a few things you may not be aware of that I'll start out this podcast informing you about. One is that our SHOT Show coverage of SHOT Show 2020 did not appear publicly. It was all on Patreon. So if you'd like to know what happened with Gun Guy TV at SHOT Show for 2020, it's all on Patreon there for you to enjoy. You just have to subscribe to Patreon and help us out a little bit. So check it out there. The one exception to that is the Gun Guy TV Firearms Podcast, which you're listening to now. On the second day of SHOT Show, we set up a bunch of audio equipment and we invited a lot of folks to come up and chat with us. That resulted in some outstanding interviews, which we're going to make a part of the podcast over the next several months. Now, some of those are very timely, and the information needs to get out soon, so we're going to post those first. The first in the series is an interview that we did with Rick Travis from CRPA, along with Jerry Clark, who joined him from the California Rifle and Pistol Association. Because this information is important, the podcast runs a little bit longer in the first segment. So as a result, there won't be a second segment because the first segment itself runs an entire hour. In order to benefit my Patreon patrons, we're going to release those podcasts about a week early so they can enjoy them before their release on the 5th and the 20th publicly for syndication. The other thing I should mention is generally on the podcast, I'll have some little breaks where I talk about how to support the podcast because of the way these are done. That just doesn't work. So I'm not going to do that in these podcasts. Instead, we'll just run the interviews all the way through for you so you can hear the entire thing without interruption. Here's the first interview with Rick Travis and Jerry Clark from the California Rifle and Pistol Association. So guys, what's what's going on with CRPA, California, and like that? And we only have half an hour, so either speak really quickly <laughs> <laughs> or, or be brief. <laughs> so no... Uh we have a lot of things going on with CRPA. One of the things that we have are chapters developing. We've had for a few years now, people in local areas. I mean, obviously California is a huge state, as you know, Joel. And so we've had people saying, hey, can members of CRPA and the public get together in different areas? And we're like, well, why not? That's, that's helpful, gives people a chance. And so we started off uh, middle, middle of the spring last year and we have 10 chapters and by, June, we should be at 25 statewide. Wow. wow. So it's it's growing very quickly, yeah. which has been a little bit like holding the tiger by the tail, but it's been it's been awesome. We got to see a lot of those volunteers up at the International Sportsman's Expo just this previous week to SHOT Show, and uh, that was well attended. It was one of the best shows we've ever had. Doubled our membership that we would normally pick up at a show like that. Uh, we've also been doing some uh, new fundraisers because I think a lot of, you know, $35 for us, NRA, just about anybody gets you a membership. But when you really look, I think sometimes people go, well, 35 bucks and I paid for everything. And it's like, yeah, no, no, that doesn't even pay for the lights to be on. Yeah. It, it pays for you know the magazine and, and all the media services to a degree, but there's all the lawsuits. And so that has been one of the things I'm going up and down the state is trying to raise funding for lawsuits because obviously the NRA has been hit, hit very hard back east. So they're having to use money that they would normally put out to other states to assist with lawsuits. They're right. having to use it to defend themselves. And uh, I'm hoping those are all good outcomes for them because they've been around for a long time, done a lot of positive things for all of us. So what we're now focusing on is raising those funds because we have several cases in front of the Supreme Court and all those take about a half a million to a million dollars once they get to the Supreme Court. And that's what a lot of people don't realize. And part of the the strategy of the socialist side of California has been to try to bleed us dry in the courts. What is it, okay, so you're talking about a half a million to a quarter of a million dollars, right around there, a quarter of a million, half a million dollars at the million, Supreme Court million. level. Yeah. Does that include the cost of getting it to the Supreme Court in the first place, or is there an no, additional cost to that? No, there's additional cost. So if you get a court case that is gonna go to Supreme, um, you're looking anywhere from a million and a half to three million dollars. Wow. 
Yeah. Wow. So when you look at a state like California, and this is one of the things I've been out talking to people, they're like, oh, we got all these bad laws. But let's look at the worst year ever was 2019. Yeah. We had 70 bills against us. We stopped all but 11. Now, granted, the 11 that got through are, and I know you don't like this word too much, but it was crap. I mean, mm. it was the worst of days. In fact, I think crap should be a legal term now. I think it may be when it comes to California <laughs> yeah. law, actually. It may yeah. be a legal term. We just don't <laughs> know it yet. Is that in their gas prices? Right. And, and so that is, that's part of the problem. And part of the problem is I've noticed in the public that once we can get people to sit down and start talking, they start to realize, wait, I'm being lied to. But it's amazing. Even in our own community, people haven't put the talking points on what, wait, that doesn't, you can't do these things and it be legal or constitutional. You know, so when I talk about um, the big success we just had yesterday, which was able to get the um, city of Los Angeles to drop their blacklisting of anybody working with the NRA or other groups like us, um, that's a huge thing. But a lot of our committee wasn't up in arms about it. But that's a First Amendment violation. And as you know on your show, I've said before, if we lose the second, we'll lose the first. This is a direct link to anybody that's paying any attention of, hey, we're going to stop your right to assemble, your right to do business, commerce, or, you know, we're going after the Fourth Amendment. The, they're one through ten, they're going after them. Well, I think the thing, it, I, if I may make a suggestion, yeah. I think that saying needs to be changed. Right. If we lose the second, we lose them all. Yeah. We don't just lose the first. We lose all of our rights. They're going to chip away at them and take them away one at a time. We can't lose the Second Amendment. We most certainly can't lose the first. If we lose the second, we lose the first, and then they're gone. And I think a lot of it, too, is we have, um, you know, I think gun owners are some of the most honorable people that you ever meet. I mean, they're law-abiding. They're, they're good people. They're the kind of people that open doors for other people, help them out, do a lot of community service. But part of that culture has been modesty. And whether it's, it's right or wrong, that's not what I'm here to critique. The problem is, you know, if I personally did something to help me save you know, a member of your family's life, I'm not running around going, look what I did. I mean, it's like, it happened, move on. But the problem with that is the, the left media has worked so hard to put everything out that's negative that no one ever hears the positive. Yet when you go to FBI stats, county sheriff stats, there's all these cases of people with CCWs that have used them and used them correctly. And so part of our, our hope is to start to get people to at least call in. We're not going to put your name out there. I mean, it's very easy to say anonymous in El Dorado County, anonymous in San Diego County did this. But to start to let the, the general public, because when I talk to a lot of general public groups, um, especially in a political year like this, it's amazing how many people come out and said, I just didn't know. Now that I know that, my view is different. How much of that is an, a modesty and how much of it is a fear of retribution by virtue of the fact that they live in California? I think it's both, but the only reason I don't think it's isolated to California is this last summer I got to travel to Texas, Idaho for a couple of hunting conferences to speak at and they're having the same issue. And obviously while Texas, especially Austin is becoming Californianized, yeah. unfortunately, you know, there's other parts of the state like San Antonio that really aren't there, and they have the same issue in San Antonio. People just, I think it's just part of our culture of like, you know, it's the same idea. One of the guys I was talking to said, you know, you go mow the lawn for your neighbor because he's fighting cancer. You don't run around the, the neighborhood saying, look what I did. Right. Well, you know, as, as, a, as a testimony to that, we, the recent church shooting in Texas, mm -hmm. we lost a deacon and we lost the one gentleman who was part of the security team and the other gentleman was able to stop it. Right. And I've seen that fellow's face on a lot of things and interviews in a lot of areas and every time I see him interviewed, it seems like he's very uncomfortable. He, he tries to do it, but he's not comfortable standing in front of the camera and hearing the microphone. And I, I feel for the guy and I, you know, I'm part of the security team at my church. Right, so I'm and here. so I've asked myself a few times if I were to be in that man's position would I want to be to get that much media attention? And the answer is no. And and look what I do. Right. Right. I'm a guy who's all over the place, all over the time. But it, for some reason or other, there's a there's a desire to look at it and say, no, I didn't do it for the purpose of getting of having people think I'm a, a great guy. I did it because it was right and it was the thing to do. And I think the other part of that too is that you know the person that that is called into action to do that had to take a life. 
And yeah. it doesn't matter that the, the person on the other side could be anything from a terrorist to just a, a really mentally ill individual. You still had to take a life. And no, I've never met anybody that wants to glorify in that. You're listening to the Gun Guy TV podcast. It's interesting to me that people will say, where is NRA in California? Mm-hmm. And I'd like you to address that because it was really interesting to me the other day. I got a couple of emails from people saying, where is NRA in Virginia? And I'm like, well, they just went out there and gave out a, a thousand yeah. 30 round magazines. And they just went out and, they, you know, are working with Magpul to do that. And they're, they're just over there doing this. They're just doing, doing over that. And I just talked about it in a video, two, you know, two days ago. Where is NRA in California? Right? Well, I think I think the first thing people have to realize is, you know, and you and I have talked, is sometimes difficult for me, and I'll just use probably the easiest area, but show the difficulty. Hunting in California is very hard because we're 58 different counties. Oh, yeah, I know. And a lot of those counties have very different personalities. I mean, Orange and San Diego County are side by side, yet completely different attitudes on a whole host of subjects. And it's almost like being from two different states. And we're literally, you and I are maybe an hour as the crow flies apart from each other. But when you look at the NRA, the NRA a lot of times has its hands actually tied because what gun owners want in one state is going to negatively impact another set of gun owners in another state. So they always have to look at it more, for lack of better terms, solid backing of the Second Amendment, slightly homogenized, so it doesn't trigger negativity for another group. And I think that feeds into a lot of people try to fundraise against the NRA to say, oh, well, they're not here, they're not engaged. They are. The NRA puts thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars into lawsuits and stuff. But right now, you got to realize we're being outgunned money-wise, including the NRA. I mean, I would say it's a fair assessment that it's about $1,000 to one against us. You know, if you look at that, and you start looking at the successes of the NRA, CRPA, Gun Owners of California, Gun Owners of America, two A groups that are out there fighting all the time, and there's a lot of others. I'm not going to take a half hour listing them all. That's what we're up against. And part of it's also realizing people have specialties. You know, the CRPA has especially that this is our 145th anniversary year. We have done all the competitive shooting sports. We're the largest, broadest conservation group in the state's history. And we've been doing legal battles and we do some video work. But a lot of times I appear on your show because you know what? That's not our expertise and we're the first ones to admit it. There are things that the NRA does because that's their expertise. I mean, we train, but we don't write train curriculum. They do because they've been doing that for over 150 years. You know, it's like people have to realize we each have our, our niches and our specialties and it doesn't take just one. And I look at people all the time and say, you really think about this. You spent, you know, a lot of people have spent thousands of dollars on their, their firearms collections. We spent thousands of dollars, whether you're a three gun shooter, a hunter, trap, dove, whatever. And then they're like, wait, I should, I should spend some money on defending those rights? Well, here's the thing I think that people don't understand is that they're, they're spending money fighting against their rights. Right. Uh, every day. Mm-hmm. I mean, every time they do their tax return, Every time they buy a, a soda pop, every pop right. time they buy you know something with sales tax or whatever, that money is going into the state coffers, which is being used to fight against their rights. So we're in this weird position where as taxpayers, we're fighting against something that we would otherwise choose not to fund that battle. Uh, you know, I don't want to fund the state's lawsuits against my rights, but I am funding it by virtue of my taxes. So it, I better step up at the same time and fund the battle to stop that. But, I mean, and you bring up a really good point that I can highlight. If you were to look right now at Californians, and we've talked about this on the show before, there's about 8 million of us that own firearms still in California. So think about that for a moment. All of us contribute to a tax called Pittman-Robertson. And I, and I want the listeners to understand what this is. This is gun owners. This is the only tax like this, actually, in the state of California. This is gun owners who have said, you know what? I care about wildlife. I care about the environment and clean ranges. I care about all these things. So you know what? Tax me an extra 15% when I buy ammo, when I buy camouflage clothing, when I buy my rifle and pistols. So those things can be funded. So that equates sometimes to $20 million in a single year in California. 
You know what we don't do as taxpayers? Go, where did the money go? And 90% of the time, it's our governors sending it back to the general accounting office saying we don't need it. While our ranges deteriorate, while programs deteriorate, the very money that we put, and while our wildlife is being obliterated. And that's one of the issues that we keep trying to, to bring up. And we have a, an issue right now with cartels that have moved in to the central and northern California area and have wiped out over a million acres of land. That's going to cost Californians about 50 years an acre to get it back and an unimaginable amount of money. Part of that money from Pittman Robertson is to go to stop that kind of stuff. And it's the irony is, you know, you get a governor saying up there going, well, we just don't have the money. And you have people like me and Sam Predis, who you'll you know, talk to later. They're like, uh, yeah, you do. And by the way, gun owners put the money forward. No, for the purpose of being used right. to resolve these particular issues right. and prevent these things from occurring, and you're not using the money for that. And that's why I talk to gun owners. I say, look, on a self-tax, the state's not using the money where it should. How can you trust them on anything else? I think this is a conversation I must have once a week with somebody. <laughs> it's incredibly easy for the legislature to pass as many anti-firearms laws as they want, and then we have to go fight them in court. Mm -hmm. And they can, they can pass them knowing full well that the darn things are uh, totally and completely unconstitutional, and they're going to sit there and be enforced until we fight them in court. Yeah. And then when we fight them in court, they're going to use our tax money from the general fund to fund the Department of Justice fighting us right. to destroy our rights. Right. And then we're going to expect gun organizations to fund the bill to fight for those rights, but we're not going to fund the gun organization. Right. The logic of that makes no sense. Yeah, and that's, that's why I'm, I'm really pushing this year to get people out and start to realize they need to fight back. So I got a question handed to me. Yay. Okay, so this is a, haven't the voters destroyed the state budget during the non-discretionary feel-good propositions? Oh, that's a question or a statement of fact? Well, <laughs> it's a question, and I'll let you elaborate on it. Go ahead. No, the budget has, for the most part, been completely destroyed, and that's one of the things I'm trying to get people to look at is to start to say, Accountability and why I use Pittman Robertson's example on this show is because we self-tax and I think it's a good talking point for a lot of gun owners to start going out there going, wait, who else in Cal of the 39.5 million Californians is out there paying for the environment? Oh wait, it's gun owners. And if that was the only thing we did, and I just want to point this out to your listeners, we would still outpace all. I'm talking World Wildlife Fund, Center for Biological Diversity, all of their work by almost 10 to 1. Like 90% just on Pittman Robertson dollars. Now you drop in all the things that happen with organizations like Cal Deer, Cal Waterfowl, Rocky Mountain Elk, and Ducks Unlimited, the list Ducks goes Unlimited, on. Right. Yeah. That number just goes up. And that's why I look at people saying, hey, as gun owners, we should be walking proud. We shouldn't be hiding in the closet. We should be standing out going, no general public realize this is what we do every day to make California a better place, and we self-impose this on ourselves. So why are we the ones getting beat up and targeted and maligned and being told we're Elmer Fudds and we're terrorists, as in LA and San Francisco, don't do business with us, take away our property, tax us, persecute us, et cetera, et cetera, when we're the ones doing the most? As you said earlier, one of the questions we have to ask is where is that money going? Because right. we contribute the money. First of all, I'd be willing to wager that the overwhelming majority of California gun owners have no idea when they buy something that that amount of money is being taxed to go to those right. to go to those those programs supposedly. And if they are aware of the fact that that money is being contributed, they have no idea that that money is not going where it's supposed to go. Well, and, and the thing that's interesting is when you go to Arizona, there's a lot of Californians that go there to go to gun shows and different things like that and go, go vacation. And they go to these beautiful ranges in Arizona. They're open to the public. They're like Disneyland to go to. Yeah. So here's a fun fact. Arizonans contribute about a ninth of what we do to Pittman-Robertson. Yeah, but the difference is the but, money actually goes where it's supposed to go. Exactly. Right. Those ranges were built completely with Pittman-Robertson dollars. In Arizona. Oh, no. Right. So Californians should be going, wait, hold the door for a minute. 
those are paid with Pittman Robertson dollars from Arizona. Yeah. Then why don't we have it? Because we do 10 times that, so we should have at least five ranges? And in the meantime, what's California doing? Actively trying to shut down every stinking range in the state Correct. as quickly as possible. Right. Shooting straight and always right on target. This is the Gun Guy TV Podcast. Okay, we're going to be talking to uh, Dennis Roman from the P2K range is coming in later on today. Wonderful. What they go through in their battle with the state of California on an everyday basis, and not just California, but the county of San Diego, that, I mean, you name it, they fight mm -hmm. that battle every stinking day, and the amount of money they have to pour into attorney's bills and everything else just to keep the lights on, it's, it's amazing. And, and what's crazy is the different ways the state throughout the state, and I talked about this earlier, attacks. So I know a lot of things P2K has to go through. Lemon Grove also down Lemon San Diego has to go right. through. Yeah. But also you go to like the range up in Redding, California, at the o diabolical opposite end. And this is the kind of junk that they throw at them. Last year, the water board came out. It had been raining. You'll remember the rains we had last year. Oh, yeah, yeah. They go and take a water sampling off of the 50-yard pistol back barrier outside to check for parts per million of lead. Okay, so right away, not fair. <laughs> no, oh, that's about but, as skewed as it's possibly but, ever going to be. But what was amazing was they had had a massive cleanup and the water was actually potable. Wow. Which, which I got to tell you right now, the inspectors and the government did not expect. No. They were hoping to be able to shut that down. But then they still tried to shut it down because they told the range owner, yeah, well, Fiji water, which is one of the most purest waters on the planet, is still better than this potable water. Wait, that's not the standard. And this is what listeners have to realize. The range still had to go get an attorney to make that argument. There's a cost to that. Wow. Well, okay, now let's talk about that. Not only is there a cost to that, but you understand, I have, I have an attorney, a business attorney. Right. Okay? Our business attorney, in, when I ever I want to use him, costs me $500 an hour. Right. Now, that's not hugely, people will say, what? That's not a lot. That's, no. that's a decent, that's actually a relatively inexpensive. Correct. But really quality yeah. business attorney. You want to hire an attorney to do these firearms things, you're talking 2500 bucks an hour. Right. That means if that attorney talks to you on the phone for 15 minutes, he's billing you for a quarter of an hour. If he thinks about you in the afternoon while he's sitting on the can, mm -hmm. he's billing you for a quarter of an hour. Right. You know, these ranges can be driven completely out of business by this. And, and who's funding the opposition? Right. As taxpayers, we are. Right. This is why, when, you know, people don't want to fund, shell out a little extra money to contribute to CRPA or NRA or whatever. Right. What they're doing is they're actually, they don't realize, I don't think they realize, they're funding the opposition, but they don't want to fund the, right. the folks who are on our side. And they don't want to hold the state and government accountable. Yeah, because they're using our Pittman Roberts. <laughs> right. Well, not just that, but just the illegal acts. I mean, when, you know, government, you know, Ronald Reagan said you can never trust. Whenever the government comes, shows up at your door and says, I'm here to help you, you should close the door because you can't trust them. And I think we've got to remind people of that. That's right. They were the eight most dangerous, most frightening words Worst, in existence. Yeah. <laughs> I'm from the government. Yeah. I'm here to yeah. help. That's, right. what, that's what Reagan said. Yeah. <laughs> and I think we've, we've got to remind the current generation out there that that's a fact. It's not, it's not just some like quote. It's, it's for real. Our founding fathers intended for us to have a limited small government for the sole purpose of being administrative and securing our rights. Right. If you look at the Bill of Rights, it, that's what it says. That we form a government for the purpose of securing those rights. And whenever the government is, becomes an opposition of those things, we have the authority and right to disband it or change it or whatever we want to do. And if, you, if, you want, if you're listening and you want to look that up, just look up the, the United States Bill of Rights and read the preamble. Right. Now we're in a position where we're now having to defend our rights against the very government which was instituted by our founding fathers to defend our rights. Right. And I think part of that comes because if you ask the average person on the street, what are we, they'll say, well, we're a democracy. No, we're, we're not. not. We're, we're a republic. representative republic. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's letting people know that this idea of I just need 51% to do anything I want to do and enslave the other 49%, it doesn't work that way. 
No, and, pre and precisely by design. Right. This is why when they want to get away, of, get, they want to do away with certain things that are really key, like the electoral college and so on. They don't right. realize, you know, <laughs> people say that, and I think you don't, you don't have no idea what you're hoping for. You're right. hoping for a huge disaster. Yeah. That's really, really strange. What else is uh, new? Jerry, you want to say something so you can say you're actually here? No, I'm actually here. You're actually here? <laughs> yes, I am actually here. No, um, I agree with Rick. Uh, a lot of everything that we are seeing now and people calling us and asking us these questions, you know, don't feel bad to call us and ask because a lot of folks are uninformed. And I think it's important for them to actually call us if they have a question. It doesn't matter. You know, we always said years and years ago, um, no question is stupid. So call us, ask us. It's important for you to understand what we're trying to do. And you know, a lot of folks will say, well, you didn't do this. Well, look at everything else we've done. And I think a lot of people are nearsighted and don't see everything that's happened along the way. One of the gaps that I see is that Folks will get upset about a single thing that, that didn't get fought to a successful conclusion. Mm -hmm. Or where money wasn't spent on that, but it was spent on something else. Right. But what they miss, and perhaps what I can help do on this show or whatever, is they miss that there, the fact that there was a strategic reason for that. Right. That there's X amount, for example, a simple version of that would be there's X amount of dollars available. Do we put it into this or do we put it into that to fight these battles? Because if we put it into this and we lose that, then that is going to cause a snowball effect that we're going to lose more. Whereas if we lose, we do it the other way around, that's a, the other way it's a smaller loss, this is a bigger victory that staves off bigger victories down the road. I mean, that's, that's one view of it. But there are a whole lot of strategic things that go into uh, figuring out what battle to fund and what, and what to fight this way or what to fight that way. And, it, and unfortunately, the general public of gun owners is not always aware of those strategic decisions because... They can't be, first of all. Sometimes it's not wise to, right. you know, to show your hand in the middle of a battle. It's, and so I think sometimes that works against us, don't you? Yeah, I think there is, like, without exposing too much of the hand, there is a good way to, to help educate the listeners on, on part of what's going on. So let's just take, um, I know Nick, you and I both hunt from time to time, but we probably both yeah. have friends, because I know I do, that are like, that's your thing, not my thing, and I don't want anything to do with it. And I get that, yeah. and I respect that. Everybody has their, their choices. But what people don't realize is, so say for argument's sake, you're just a three gun shooter. So you're like, I don't do the hunting thing. You guys have fun with that. Well, here's the problem. Three gun shooters use semi-automatic firearms. One of the number one ways we get a lot of Republicans and Democrats, I would say, are centrists to vote with us is because they're like, oh, wait, if I don't let you have the semi-automatic firearm, you guys don't have semi-automatics when you go small game hunting and do, you know, I'm not going to do that to the hunters. Well, your win was because of the hunting side of the house. And so sometimes people will look at the NRA and CRPA and gun owners and go, why were you, why were you defending the hunters? Hey, that was so we could defend you. And it's easier to go to someone in the central and go, you know, you're taking people's ability to, to put food on the table away from them when you, you do this. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Yeah. Abraham Lincoln, I think, said that too one time. He may have. I don't know. Yeah. But that's actually in the Bible. a nation divided. That, that is in the Bible. <laughs> he may have said a nation. But that is actually in the yeah. Bible. And so you, here's, here's something that's biblical saying that if we are divided and we're fighting amongst mm -hmm. ourselves, then there's no way we can fight the, the enemy that we really have. Right. So it's, I think it's important. I mean, I, for example, I love duck hunting. So mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm a fan of Ducks Unlimited. Right. I'm not a member at the moment, but I probably should go pay my membership. Right. So now that I've opened my big fat <laughs> yap, I got to do something about that. And get that and cool T-shirt. My, bu my buddy Zach will be calling me because he was president of the local chapter for a while. Hey, wait a minute, you didn't? <laughs> okay, but you know, I'm a fan of duck hunting, bird hunting. Nick and I love bird hunting. We love mm -hmm. shotgunning. And so I guess I could say, well, you know, I love shotgunning, but I don't, you know, I don't partake in small game hunting. So you guys, who cares about you? But the truth is, as gun owners, as lovers of the Second Amendment, right. whether it's because we hunt or because we're concerned about the self-defense aspect of it and concealed carry, or because we hunt this as opposed to that, or we're in competitive shooting, if one of us falls, we all fall. Right. 
Yeah. We've got to start to, we've got to understand that and stop fighting amongst ourselves. If we want to develop energy, uh, fighting energy toward anything, let's develop it against the folks that are trying to take our rights away. And I think the other thing is we've got to, I think gun owners tend to be more like Eeyore at times, you know, from the Disney Winnie the Pooh oh, yeah, thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, that'll never work. Right. <laughs> right. And, and they don't take pride in when we have some wins. So, like, here we are in California. I mean, and I hear all the jokes when I go, you know, to other parts of the country. Oh, from Socialist California. Oh, you're behind yeah. the Iron Curtain. How'd you get out? And, and a lot of that's funny, but if you were to look at where we were a decade ago in CCWs, Statewide. Oh, it's different. Oh, totally different. And I had, and like you, I had a permit a decade ago. Right. But I think if I found the other guy in San Diego County that had one, we could have formed a club. Right. But there, but there just weren't that many. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. There were probably right. <laughs> two in the and, whole county, maybe. You know, I don't know. I, I'm looking at people going. If you look at, we have sheriffs have come up with apps to apply. Right, Orange County. Know? Right. Um, and Fresno, Margaret Mims up there was the first one to develop it. You look at counties that had a hundred. And that's all they'd ever had. Now they're up at 2,000. And, it, and people are like, oh, it's only 2,000. Wait, wait, stop. If I opened up a business and said I sold 100 widgets and I made this new game plan and then I sold the next year 2,000 widgets. You, the you, bank could be investing money in you. Right. <laughs> right, happily so. Whereas gun owners are like, yeah. And it's like, no, you need to realize. And not only that, but it's being done in a backdrop of where we actually have an active assembly and Senate and governor's office trying to destroy our culture. And we're pushing back. And we've got some yeah. amazing wins that people aren't watching. You're listening to the Gun Guy TV podcast. Please pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. I just got an email the other day from Michael Schwartz of so San Diego uh -huh. County Gun Owners. That's a great little organization in San Diego, and they work pretty closely with, right. uh, with the, uh, the sheriff there. Right. And Michael's a great guy. Uh -huh. He sent me an email the other day to let me know, because he sent it to all the instructors. I've been an instructor in San Diego forever today for the CCW, that the sheriff is considering strongly making a change from allowing three guns to be listed on the permit to six. Uh -huh. Now, you might say to yourself, well, that, who cares? That's, a, that's, not, that's not a big enough change. What I have seen Sheriff Gore do who at one point was decidedly anti-issue and yep. really made it hard to issue these things. Because I've been teaching a class right. forever, and I've had a permit for, since 1990, so I can tell you it, it was a very different world at uh -huh. one point. To see him incrementally, obviously moving the county to shall issue, which is where it seems he's going, is incredibly encouraging. But it's not going to happen like a switch that gets flipped. It's going to happen more like a rheostat. We're turning up the light a little bit at a time. And this is an excellent example of different groups working on the same problem. If you look at how Gore got there, you have to look at a bigger picture of not just San Diego County. You have to look at Southern California. We had, other than Riverside County at the time and San Bernardino, which had Sheriff Sniff at the time this was going on, McMahon, respectively, they were issuing a fair amount of CCWs, not a lot, but they weren't being restricted. But you had, in Orange County, you had Sheriff um, Hutchins, who came out of Baca's thing in LA, and she was like, uh-uh, not happening. She actually pulled the CCWs, and that was a big issue. You had Gore down the south, nope, not gonna do it. What happened? The Pruda case. CRPA and the NRA put a ton of money into that fighting it. Now everybody's like, yeah, but you know what, Rick, it got stopped, it, yeah. Pause for a moment. Then local groups like San Diego County Gun Owners were mean with Gore. We kept suing, kept pushing. It took all of that coming at different angles. And then Hutchins was the first one to break. And she met with us and said, okay, how do we do this? And ironically, part of the way, the way where she made her move was she said, so I do believe hunters should be able to have CCWs. And I looked at her and said, but there's nowhere to hunt in Orange County. I mean, <laughs> You're right. Yeah, well, you got two hunters in the whole county. And, and she said, yeah, but she goes, you can't be a felon and have a hunting license. And she goes, and there's a group of people that do mean things like puncture tires, blow up engines, do stuff like that to hunters when they're out. And she goes, I don't want an Orange County hunter being left in harm's way where they can't defend themselves. So she started issuing. Now they went from a couple of hundred to over 20,000. And shall issue. Right, and right. now she, before she left office, and Sheriff Barnes who took up, 
along with others, are pushing. We have a massive CCW conference with all the sheriffs sending all their different people in. And so we've got sheriffs in the Bay Area issuing, which you and I, wow. a couple years ago, have been. I, if you'd have told me that was yeah. going to happen, I would have bet you $1,000, and, and you'd be yeah. $1,000 richer because right. I'd have lost the money. And the sheriff of Solano County is the one hosting the conference for the second year in a row. Uh, who'd have thought it, right? right. <laughs> I mean, you know. And, and you look at, at the patchwork, that it's no longer a patchwork. It's becoming a solid line with the majority of the sheriffs. I mean, 56 of the departments are showing up to this conference. Well, we only have 58 sheriffs. Right. Right, so there's two guys missing. We, 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 <coughs> you know, uh, you uh, who might they be? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. But when you start to look at that, that is, that's changing the game. And then you also have to realize that once you have that permit, you can go in any county. And so that is causing people in places like L.A. and San Francisco to go, wait a second. There are people on the border counties that come in and are work. They're protected. I'm not. What, you mean if you live in L.A. County or up there in the San Francisco area, you cannot get a permit? Would those uh, be the two places that maybe if you yeah. live in that area, <laughs> yeah. you might want to make some noise about that? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Hint, hint, hint. Well, right. <laughs> right. And, and I think that's important. I think it's also important for those of us on the outside of those counties to make noise on behalf of our brethren. Because, you know, I remember back when we got Prop 63, shoved down our throats and people are like well san francisco is a lost cause Fifty thousand people in san francisco had the courage to go to the polls and vote against it yeah and you know it was a very small area you know d during uh, the airlift in berlin when some people at the table here weren't even born and the rest of us were little toddlers at best <laughs> but i mean we as Jerry, a country, why do I get the feeling he's talking about me? <laughs> I'm a little concerned about that. <laughs> but I agree. Yeah. But if, if you look at it, we spent millions of dollars airlifting food to a group like that. And so a lot of times when I'm out on the road, I say, we got brothers and sisters definitely in the belly of the beast that are fighting back. They have group meetings in San Francisco. They're trying to do it. And so when I'm in a county that is not as restrictive as the Bay, I'm like, what's your excuse? Because these people are doing it at risk because they can't meet anywhere without everybody knowing it, implying a lot of pressure. Well, you know, here's a, this brings up another subject, which is we, we talked about the division of gun owners among different mm -hmm. uh, hobbies that they like within the shooting sports or uh, whatever it is about shooting that they're fond of or gun ownership they're fond of. We also have sort of a weird division because of cultural differences. Mm -hmm. and, I, and so I'm going to bring up... A, the Pink Pistols, for example, yeah. which is an awesome organization, and they fight very hard for the Second Amendment. But we, we, so I think we've got to, as gun owners, we've got to stop having stigmatizing groups because we disagree with them politically, right. or we disagree with them on a lifestyle basis, or we disagree with them. Look, we're all Americans, mm -hmm. and particularly in California, we're all Californians, right. and we, we come together as gun owners for the purpose of, of rescuing our Second Amendment and our rights, do we need to be messing with each other with regard to what color our hair is or how we live or whatever? No, and you know, we have worked with several different organizations. Pink Pistols is one of them. We've also worked with Black Guns Matter. You know, and go to the events. We held two years on road events in Compton. And, and people are like, what? And I'm like, yeah, and you know what? There's no difference. I mean, when I had... Well, you know, astoundingly, Rick, the folks in Compton are Americans and they have rights too. Yeah, really, yeah. You know, and, you know, when I had, you know, moms with three or four kids and, you know, something's happened to the dad, um, they're sitting there going, hey, I'm scared for my children. I need to have a gun, but I've been told I can't buy one. I mean, the same myths perpetrated on them are the same ones that are perpetrated anywhere else in this state. You know, and we sit there and go, no, that's not true. No, that's not true. This is how you do it. You know, we had a range and a couple of FFLs working with them. And at the end of the, the two hours, we had 40 new gun owners. How, how fabulous. You know, and it's like, that's, that's incredible. One of the things that disturbs me about the cost of gun ownership, the cost of carrying a, a firearm, CCW, and those kind of things, when we do have a right that says the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall, be, shall mm -hmm. not be infringed, is the fact that while I, I make a good living, uh -huh. You know, we're sitting at this table. I can afford to pay for the CCW. I can afford to buy the gun. I can afford all those things. But, you know, you live in a lower socioeconomic neighborhood. First of all, sometimes the crime rates in those neighborhoods are higher, and right. you really need a CCW, right. maybe more than I do, because in my neighborhood there's 
hardly any crime. You right. know, the, the cops, if they get called up there, feel like they're on vacation for a couple of hours because <laughs> they never get to go there. You know what I mean? Right. These laws really restrict and infringe upon the folks that make less money or live in the tougher neighborhoods, don't they? Oh, yeah, they definitely do. And I think, I think there's an overall economic viewpoint on, you know, especially if we're going to limit this to the CCW argument, of people understanding their economic choices. You know, as you brought it up, there are certain sports I don't do because I have a couple things that I do. Like I hike, camp, backpack, those have costs. My car choice was made primarily to support that. So I don't do other sports. You know, I have friends that play with all these cool camera things like you've got. I just, I can't play in that thing and do everything at once. And I think that's one of the things you got to look at is not, CCW is not a sport, but it is a lifestyle choice. And that's one of the things that we've talked to them and, you know, we raise money. Um, we've helped out with some people as far as being able to find FFLs that were willing to work with them and put things on layaway, stuff like that. And it's amazing because, you know, one of the FFLs was like, well, that will never work because they'll never come pick it up. That's never been the case. I, yeah, I don't believe that. Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't and, believe it. Because if you're the single mom right. and you got three kids, uh -huh. you're trying to raise these kids on one income and you're in a and you're in a tough neighborhood. And let me go back to that. It was interesting because we there was a reporter there and this just kind of blew me away because it's kind of that cultural um, cognitive dissonance that we get of, you know, I'm supposed to be the white supremacist because I'm a gun owner. And the reporter is supposed to be like, Mr. or Miss, like, I love everybody. But we're in Compton, and one of the ladies said, hey, I have two kids. I'm a single mom. She's talking. And the reporter's like, yeah, probably a deadbeat dad. And the fact was, her husband died in Afghanistan. Right. Well, wow. can, we not, and, can we not assume, please? Right. And, and I was like, okay, number one, that's just flat out wrong. But number and reporter never apologized, just kept going on. And I'm like, okay, so this is just multiplying. And this woman's having to deal with life after her husband. She had to move back into the old neighborhood because of economics. Like, that was never her game plan, but this is where she's ended up. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. And she's and, like. And, and why? Because her husband served his country. Right. And he lost his life doing it. And then she was trying to understand why, you know, she lives in Compton, and her sister lives over in Cerritos, and her sister can have a CCW, and she can't. And she said, literally, I've invited my sister over to my house sometimes, so there's somebody there because of the things going on in the neighborhood. And I'm like, this is how crazy it's got. Saving the Second Amendment, one episode at a time. This is the Gun Guy TV Podcast. To give you an idea, though, how far we've come, which is right. very good, and it, just to kind of give us a bridge so people understand, we've come a long way. Yes, we have. I've had a CCW for a long, long time because I've been a business owner for a long time. I own practical defense systems. I've owned a real estate brokerage. I'm right. one of those guys I could never get a job, so right. I always had to make one. Right. Nobody would ever hire me. I'm a <laughs> schmuck, so I always had to make a job. But as a result, I've had a permit for many, many years. I had a very good friend named Perry. I won't say his last name. He's a deputy sheriff. And at the time, with the Sheriff's Department you were e in San Diego, you were either a correctional deputy or you were out in the field. Right. Now, years prior, you were in the jail for three or four years, and then you went out in the field if right. you wanted to. But at the time, at that time, I don't know what it is now, they had changed that policy, and you, were, you made a choice. You were in the jail or you were out patrol. on yeah. patrol. He had decided to stay in the jail. Well, as your correctional deputy, the sheriff we had at the time, made the decision that the correctional deputies, because they're not out on patrol, they don't run into criminals that might hurt them somewhere, and so they can't <laughs> carry off duty. Yeah, right. Which, of course, is... <laughs> in, it, I don't even need to explain how stupid and but insane you know that. what? You do. Because it's interesting, when, when I'm talking to the general public, I don't think so much gun owners, but the general public, they're like, oh, well, that makes sense because the bad guys are in jail. Yeah, the bad guys that that correctional deputy had to keep under control who those people that didn't want to be kept under control took notes are the same people that when they get released are looking for that correctional deputy for payback time. And they see him at a restaurant with his right. wife and they kill him and his wife right. too. Okay. So right. Perry would call me 
and say, hey, brother, would you go with me to such and such because it's kind of a, you know, I'm afraid I might run it. It's kind of a rough part of town. I'm afraid I might run into one of these people I see in the jail. So here I am with a business owner with a CCW. I'm having to go with a sheriff's deputy right. to make sure I'm there to defend my friend if he gets spotted by some, you know, crook right. who he happened to have to deal with in the San Diego County Jail. Mm -hmm. We've gone from that to where we are now, which right. is an enormous leap in the right direction. Uh, you and I agree that the Second Amendment is your permit. You right. shouldn't have to have a permit. Right. You have a right to carry it. You shouldn't have to genuflect in front of a government authority right. or pay them to exercise a constitutionally protected right. Correct. So that's that. We don't need to argue about that. Yep. But we can't. We're not going to get there with, at the, like I said, at the flip of a switch. We're getting there incrementally mm -hmm. because we were foolish enough not to pay attention, and we lost our rights incrementally. We're going right. to get it back the same way. That costs money, and it takes time, and it takes persistence. Right. We can't. We're, we can't just work a little and then give up and expect everybody else to fight for our rights. And, and like you said earlier, I'm not whining. I think where a lot of people. And it's, again, one of those myths. It's like, yeah, but if I cross the line to help and insert whatever group, if it's a local group that's based in a county, like you said, San Diego County Gun Owners, if it's a big group like the NRA or a statewide group like CRPA, the issue that I think we're facing all the time is people think, well, now I have to give up, like, 40 hours a month. No. You know, a lot of times we're asking for, like, an hour and three months. If we could get it. You know, it's like, hey, can you make this phone call? And you'd call? be thrilled to have that. Yeah. Right. Can you do this? And what people don't realize, then they, they tell themselves a second lie, which is, well, okay, Rick, if I did that, it's it's not going to have any impact. No, it has a huge impact because if I get a thousand of you to give up an hour, that's a thousand hours. And a thousand hours will move the needle. I'm going to admit my complete ignorance because the truth is, as supportive as I am of, of CR. PA, NRA, and you know, right. gun owners of uh, California. Sam's going to be here later on today. And so yeah. on. I never did that math. Yeah. I never thought about that. I, in fact, say that again because that's right. so <laughs> stinking important right there. Say one it again. One hour from a thousand people is a thousand hours. And that's why that one hour is so important. It's so vital to the movement. Now, watch and this. How many gun owners do we have in the state of California? Eight million. Yeah. Right? Do the we ought to be able to carve a 1,000 people out so, of there somewhere. So that's why when people look at me and go, well, how can we lose to mom? It's just money. It's you know money from Moms Demand Action, which we all know comes from Michael Bloomberg and things like that. Right. And I'm like, yeah, but we can stop that. Just I need an hour. And people are like, but that won't have an impact. Yeah, it does. And it's the same thing with voting. Well, my vote doesn't count. You not voting was a vote for the other side. So if I can get you to do two things, vote and give an hour, we can push back. Not voting is a double negative. Right. Okay. That, i got to explain <laughs> that now. Okay. If you vote, then you've cast one vote. If you don't vote, you've negated your own vote and in the process empowered the vote against you. Correct. So you've really voted twice by not voting, and you Correct. voted twice in the wrong stinking direction. So Correct. it's extremely important that yeah. you vote. And especially at the lower level, because, you know, there's all the big names. But you got to remember, Gavin Newsom didn't just walk in and become governor. He didn't just walk in and become mayor. At one point, he was a low-level candidate. But there were people that probably didn't care for him, but went, ah, eh, that'll never happen. And that's why I tell people all the time, I don't care if the person's running, if you know they're anti the Second Amendment, First Amendment, and they're running for dog catcher, yeah, make be, sure that, they don't get elected. You bet, because that person will end up being mayor, who will end right. up being, being the county supervisor or the, or the assemblyman assembly or whatever, right. and the next thing you know, they're right. running for governor. Or, they're, then, or then, they're running for the House of the Senate. And then people go, well, it won't go that bad. Well, Gavin's talking about 24, running for president. Oh, my goodness. Gavin Grusom, Gavin Nuisance is president. Yeah. yeah. What was his last name again? Grusom Nuisance? <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, there's somebody that has come up the same food chain that the people are trying to right now in this election in 2020. And that's why local politics are so important to watch who's coming up. And for us as gun owners to say, hey, oh, no, 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 I know him. You know, maybe I was in a, a rotary club. No, he's not a friend of ours. Because they're not going to come out and say that because too many of the local elections are, oh, this is non-political. I don't belong to a party. I have no belief. 
please. Seriously. <laughs> please, <laughs> Come please. On. Come yeah. on now. Well, I have no opinion. Vote for me. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, please. So. This podcast needs your help. Send your entire wallet to The Gun Guy, 1313 Mockingbird Lane, Transylvania. Nick, congratulations for being here. <laughs> you know, you know he, he's, he's so respectful of his father, he lets me ans- ask all the questions. So before I get, do you have anything you want to uh, chime in about? I, I find it very interesting that... Um, just being the youngest person in uh, in on the in the round table. Oh, yeah. <laughs> One of the things I discover with young with uh, people my generation is that we find ourselves either too broke to even think about these things, mm-hmm. uh, or if we do think about these things, it's not the norm. So it, we're, my, I can't tell you how many friends of mine that will jump on any bandwagon that makes their hearts feel kind and warm and gentle uh-huh. uh and it's just it is so against the norm to even think and say hey I, hey by the way i own guns it's like you name it right <laughs> and it's yeah. like okay uh so i i find at least personally i find it very interesting it's like okay well and i'm, I'm sitting here you listening to you talk it's like wow you know what like i'm not a kid anymore mm-hmm. you know, how many i can't tell you how many of my friends who are uh going into 30 or our 30 you're like hey oh you know what i like it was weird i had to go rent my own car today like i haven't had to do that before right. or like you know like it's just like that weird growing up and uh it's I, I don't know why that is but it's it's a sense of taking responsibility for uh for our own country like oh by the way hey you know what i am a citizen here mm-hmm. this is my rights i'm uh you know at some point these laws won't affect aren't just going to affect uh, my parents or my family members ahead of me. It's actually going to affect me for the longer run. Uh, and I need to actually step up and say something and do something. Um, what kind of, like, how do you, what would be some ways to, I guess, to empower, or I'm, I hate using that word because everyone says empowerment, but, right. no, but uh, you know, to encourage. Now, I think a lot of it comes down to, you know, I have three wonderful kids who are in your age range. Um, to go from 28 to 32. And so one of the things, because we have these family discussions, because they're not all politically aligned perfectly. Sure. They have their own beliefs, and that's the way their mom and I raised them. And one of the things that we talk about all the time is every generation. It's not just the millennials that did this, Gen X did it, boomers did it. There's that period of time that you're coming into, like, yeah, I really am an adult and struggling with why is mom and dad and people of their generation not moving out of the way? And that's because right. the people of that generation are like, hey, we're in our 50s, and maybe even 60s, waiting for our parents to move out of the way because they're still calling us kids. So you know, that's right. like a generational struggle that's went on for eons, mm-hmm. and we're not going to fix that part. But I think a lot of it is learning how to take subject matters and making it personal for our friends. You know? And so as I was coming up, and I've shared with your dad about this, I've always invited people over for barbecues, especially if I've taken a pig in the field, because that helped them go, wow. And then I was able to sit there and say, hey, and you know, while hunting takes a bad rap, you know, all of us here having this barbecue, somebody in our background was a hunter. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. So this is kind of like going back to your family roots. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, it takes away, like you said, that initial negative reaction, because people start going, Nobody wants to sit and go, yeah, my great-grandpa was a total, wait, what? No, right. my great-grandpa was cool. Oh, this right. is something. And, and personalizing, and I think what's happened is, as each generation comes up, it takes time for them to realize this is a part of the fabric of who they are. Yeah. And making it personal. It's really easy for me to say, love the coffee cup because it's really cool. Oh, okay, because it's an immediate feel-good thing. But right. it's, it just takes a little time to talk, and I think... Um, our attention spans are about the same as a goldfish anymore because yeah. we just get pounded with so much that we have to really think of how to do that. Um, it's the same thing of, you know, looking at women. And I say this all the time in California, and I'll, I'll try to finish up on this point, but it amazes me. California, I, my mo- most precious thing that my wife ever helped provide for me was our daughter. You know, I was one of those guys, I went sons, and I was blessed to have a daughter first. And she's one of my best friends. Yeah. And she's everything to me. And I told my little girl growing up, she could be anything she ever wanted to be. Yeah. And she's in a state that gives her an incredible assortment of rights, but not the right to defend herself. 
Yeah. And we talked about that. And she, she's a school teacher in the inner cities in LA, and she has shared that with other school teachers and said, think about it for a moment. We have the right to do this, 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 this. What good are they if we can't defend our own life? Yeah. And that has caused within her school other young women in their 20s and early 30s to say, hey, that's an issue. Yeah, I got a friend right now, he's a really good friend of mine, who's an EMT, and he's actually voiced several times, he said, look, on the job, we get mistaken as cops, and we uh -huh. have guys come at us, and we're trying to save their buddy's life who was shot. Right. And they don't, and they're trying to come at us, and we, I don't feel safe. How do, like, he'd talk to dad, say, hey, how do I, how do I get a CCW? And he stopped pursuing it because his job, or he just found out, hey, you know what, you're too young to even think about that type of stuff. Or you're on the job doing this as an EMT, you shouldn't have a firearm. Or even off duty, you shouldn't even, like, like he, right. got, he got just berated with that type of stuff. Uh -huh. um, and he has no idea how to really fight it. And, I, and it's like one of those, it was very uh, eye-opening for him. It was like, well, you know, you can vote. You know, there's, you can call, you can complain. Those are things that you can do because you need to do it. Because EMTs and paramedics, those right. guys, firemen, they yeah. should be able to carry because, you know, people out there are weird. And part of it, too, is I think helping to teach people and generations. I mean, you know, there are fair weather fans in sports, and then yeah. there are diehard fans. Yeah. And the diehard fans try to teach the fair weather fans, no, you always stand up for your team even when they're, they're lousy. Yes. You know, you just do that. And I think that's part of the growth process, too, is teach them, like, hey, you know, you'll stand up for your football team or basketball team or hockey team. Why not your rights? Oh, you know, it's interesting about the whole EMT fireman fireman thing in San Diego County is the sheriff is issuing permits for them, but they can't carry it work. Yeah, and again, I think part of that's, you know, part of that's a national issue because you have uh, major companies that are actually owned by the Canadians like AMR. Yeah. Um, that that's more of a, a national fight that we've got to get that through because a lot of first responders are, okay, first problem is going after law enforcement and trying to kill them. That's just absolutely wrong. I have a son yeah. who's a law enforcement officer. Like, that's one of my big fears as a dad. But I'm a former paramedic, and so I know what it's like to be on the other side and be mistaken because you're wearing a dark blue uniform. It's at night, and people automatically think, oh, lights, dark blue uniform, you're the bad guy. Right. And, and there was a big controversy when some of us in certain areas just started wearing vests, thinking, well, at least if we get shot, we might survive it. Right. But couldn't carry. Yeah, now, and it's the same idea. I mean, you know, I think it was the Air Force was the first one that came out with the true combat medics where they could actually fight back. And that was like so controversial when that started up because they were like, wait, a medic shooting back? But one of the things, and this is a good example, one of the arguments that the Air Force made that I thought they did effectively, they said, yeah, but think about it. That medic is covering a soldier, a sailor who is dying. They can't fight for themselves. Yeah. So they're fighting to protect their patient. And all of a sudden, people in Congress and everywhere took a step back and went, oh, that makes sense. Yeah. But it was because there was a stigma that if you're saving a life, you can't be called to take a life. When it was like, oh, you're saving a life and you're protecting the life you're saving. Oh, that makes sense. Thank you very much for listening. I really do appreciate it. Have a wonderful and safe week. And wherever you go and whatever you do, please be safe. You've been listening to the Gun Guy TV podcast. 